On this Tuesday night, the staggering destructions from BC's extreme weather. I've seen floods in this town, but not from rain and not this time of year. Thousands homeless, communities submerged, roads in ruins, and a global news photographer's traumatic close call. This roar came and it hit my truck. There was trees flying. I thought it was a goner. The conflict brewing within the federal Conservative Party. The infighting over Aaron O'Toole's leadership and who's leaping to his defense. And anger erupts over Moscow's missile test in space. Is this how Russia has to get people's attention? The fears of what the Kremlin is up to. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with the devastating impact of the extreme weather in B.C. Thousands of people are out of their homes. Highways are completely washed away. And tonight there are reports multiple people may have been killed, swept away in mudslides. Eyewitnesses had told police they saw people in vehicles caught in this, a wall of mud and trees cascading down the mountain and across Highway 99 north of Pemberton, B.C. Search and rescue teams are still on the scene and the RCMP confirm a woman's body has been recovered. The scale of the flooding is unprecedented. This is Abbotsford in BC's Fraser Valley, the Trans-Canada Highway completely submerged. And the water is still rising. This morning, 1,100 people there were told to leave their homes. Merritt, a city of 7,000, is still underwater. A month's worth of rain fell in two days. In the town of Princeton, floodwaters broke through a natural gas line, cutting off heat to hundreds of homes, and temperatures are set to plunge below freezing. This is what's left of the Trans-Canada Highway and the rail line through the Fraser Canyon. And this is the Coquihalla Highway, a big section completely severed. Provincial officials say the highways could take weeks, if not months, to repair. We have extensive coverage tonight, beginning with Robin Gill and that deadly mudslide. The intense rain had loosened so much debris that it had nowhere to go but across the highway north of Whistler. Global News photographer Mike Timbrell was coming around a bend when the mudslide hit. I heard this loud, terrifying roar. <clears throat> Sorry. It's okay. This roar came and it hit my truck. And there was trees flying. I had my seatbelt on. I took it off and I laid on the floor of my truck. And my truck was moving all over, getting hammered by trees. I thought it was a goner. Before it all came crashing down, he had seen other cars stopped and people standing on the road. Now he's not sure they survived. It was almost like in the blink of an eye, there was a road, there was cars, there was people. And then, bang, everything was gone. Search and rescue teams have confirmed at least one body is buried in the debris. Our teams did discover um, a, n a small number of vehicles uh, on the slide path. On another highway east of Vancouver, a rescue mission needed help from the Canadian military. This was Monday when more than 200 people were airlifted out after spending 24 hours trapped in their cars caught between two mudslides. We kept our cars running almost all night to stay warm. They're still not any closer to their own beds. It's another night at the local high school or church, and the frustration is setting in. You know, we're trapped here. There's no help. The heavy rains have taken out parts of Highway 1, the main route of the Trans-Canada Highway in BC, and part of the Coquihalla, the major artery connecting Vancouver to the interior of the province. In some cases, it could be hours or just a day or two to remove debris. In others, such as the, uh, the washout on the Coquihalla, it may well be, uh, you know, several weeks or months. In Abbotsford, the farming community has now expanded its evacuation order to more than 1,100 homes. We are focused, laser focused on safe people's safety first. I am turning my mind already to livestock and the poultry industry because we are an ag producing jurisdiction number one in Canada. And there are still rescues happening for people who tried to drive through the deluge. 5,000 cars were trapped at one point in this community. You could not see where the side of the road was. People were going off the side of the road. We had cars flipped over. As for Mike Timbrell, he was picked up by another driver. But he won't ever forget what almost happened to him. 
a matter of inches, me making it out. Just inches. The shock of what's happening is still palpable, and he can't help thinking about the others caught in the chaos. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. There have been some terrifying moments. Here's a little more from Global News photographer Mike Timbrell, who was driving back from his cabin yesterday on Highway 99. He thought he'd made it through the worst of it when he came upon some cars and people stopped on the road. The people started walking back towards their vehicles, and they were like on both sides of the road. And as that happened, I heard this loud, terrifying roar. And, sorry. This roar came and it hit my truck. And there was trees flying. I had my seatbelt on. I took it off and I laid on the floor of my truck. And my truck was moving all over, getting hammered by trees. I thought it was a goner. It finally all stopped. And I managed to get out the passenger door and run. I, I turned around, looked at my truck. And it was half buried. And all the cars that were on the road and all the people, they were just gone. Gone. Global News photographer Mike Timbrell. The city of Merritt, B.C., remains off limits. An evacuation order issued yesterday is expected to stay in place for at least a week. Water levels are dropping, but officials have yet to assess the damage to the city's wastewater treatment plant and other vital infrastructure. Some residents are watching it all unfold from afar, including the owner of this home whose doorbell camera captured the flood water rising up to the porch. With so many highways washed out, there aren't too many places to go. Some people are sheltering in Kamloops. That's where our Heather Urex West is tonight. Heather, some evacuees, though, may be on the move again. Yeah, Donna, it has just been an exhausting ordeal for the people of Merritt. All day, people have been lining up outside this evacuation reception center here in Kamloops. But the city does not have enough accommodation for everyone. Pass number one. The evacuees of Merritt on the move for a second time. To Kelowna because it's the only place they found accommodations for us. David Stringer had to be rescued by boat after floodwater surrounded his Merritt trailer on Monday. He spent a long night on a cot here in Kamloops before hitting the road again. It's been pretty stressful. Uh, we were in Merritt, BC and we got evacuated twice yesterday. First time we went to my grandma's house, then it started to flood there. Jordan Young found one of the last rooms in town, trying to turn the harrowing ordeal into a fun adventure for her two little girls. There, there was, was a flood. flood. Yeah, there's a flood and we saw it. The flooding took many in Merritt by surprise. After the city's water treatment facility failed, the city of 7,000 was placed under an evacuation order. Luckily, the amount of water that was coming down the rivers is down substantially. Um, the waters are starting to recede. But that doesn't mean the city is safe for residents to return. The community is still without water or sewage and parts of the city can no longer be safely accessed at all. Unfortunately, overnight, the uh, one of the spans of the Middlesbrough Bridge, which is the central one of the three bridges, collapsed into the river. Uh, as a result, we're not confident about the structural integrity of any bridge over the Coldwater River. Officials aren't sure how many people have remained in Merritt, but those who have left aren't being allowed back inside. RCMP barricades have been set up around the community. Stressed. Yeah, just want to get back home and and um, just get the kids back to school. They miss school and everything. But there is little that can be done. Just three months after nearly losing their community to fires, residents of Merritt forced out by a devastating flood. And while the rains have stopped in Merritt, what could hamper cleanup efforts now is the cold. Once the sun sets tonight, the temperature is expected to drop to minus 8, which means that lingering flood water there could turn to ice. Donna? All right, Heather, you're west. Thanks.
Survivors of sexual misconduct in the military are still waiting for a long-promised and legally required apology from the federal government. The deadline to submit claims for a settlement as part of a class action lawsuit is next week, and the number of claimants has now soared to more than 15,000. There have been over 1,400 new claimants in just one week. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson reports. An apology is a validation. Two years after survivors of military sexual misconduct were promised an apology from the Government of Canada and the Canadian Armed Forces, they're still waiting. At this time last year, survivors were told the apology was imminent, but it never came. And while it may be just a gesture, the acknowledgement of what survivors have experienced is important validation for many. Apologies can be very powerful when they're sincere. Nine months into the military sexual misconduct scandal that has rocked the Canadian Armed Forces, the apology is finally coming, according to a senior defence source. And I'm sincerely sorry. But unlike other high-profile apologies by the Liberal government for historic wrongs, it will not be delivered by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, or his defence minister, or any elected member of the Liberal government. Instead, it will be Acting Chief of the Defence Staff General Wayne Eyre and Deputy Minister Jody Thomas who will be on tap. That sends the wrong message, according to Megan McKenzie, an expert on military culture. I think the apology should come from the Prime Minister. A move, McKenzie says, would signal the gravity of the apology and commitment to change the military culture, which has been plagued by allegations of sexual misconduct at the top. There's kind of an irony that there's been um, two different um, chief of defense staffs that could have delivered this apology but are now embroiled in their own um, scandals and allegations. The government is legally required to apologize as part of a $900 million class action lawsuit settlement that was reached in 2019. Advocates say the true sincerity of the government will be measured in actions taken and not just in the apologies delivered. Mercedes Stevenson, Global News, Ottawa. Tensions are escalating at the fortified border between Poland and Belarus. Polish forces used water cannon and tear gas against migrants who were throwing rocks and trying to break through barbed wire fences. At least 18 people were injured, including seven police officers. About 4,000 migrants, mostly from the Middle East, are stranded at the border. Poland has deployed thousands of troops to try to hold them back. And the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, is accused of pushing the migrants to the border to try to destabilize the EU in revenge for sanctions on his authoritarian regime. He denies engineering the crisis and claims his government has deported 5,000 illegal migrants. A drug maker makes a deal. Coming up, Pfizer's prescription to help make treatment for COVID-19 more accessible. The drug company Moderna has asked Health Canada to authorize its COVID-19 vaccine for children aged 6 to 11. Health Canada says it will make the review a priority. It will include an assessment of clinical trial data to be sure the benefits outweigh the risks. This is the second COVID-19 vaccine awaiting authorization for kids under 12 in Canada. Health Canada received a submission from Pfizer last month and expects to issue a decision in the next two weeks. Pfizer has struck a deal to let generic drug companies produce its experimental COVID-19 antiviral pill. The agreement covers 95 lower-income countries and could make the treatment available to more than half the world's population. The antiviral pill is urgently needed in places struggling with access to vaccines. Crystal Gamansing explains. Nearly two years into the pandemic, a new deal that could help treat COVID-19. Pfizer says it will allow lower-income countries to make and sell its experimental antiviral pill. Potentially doesn't have to be that expensive to produce and doesn't require people to go to hospital. The deal allows established generic drug manufacturers to apply to make the pills royalty-free. A similar agreement was also signed with Merck. Pfizer's antiviral pill is designed to stop the virus from replicating. The company shared promising clinical trial data earlier this month. Within three days of the symptoms, you have now 89% protection from disease leading to hospitalization with our medicines. 
The New Deal applies to 95 countries covering about 53% of the world's population. Doctors Without Borders asks, what about the other 47%? As a matter of humanity, we cannot let this exorbitant uh, profitary uh, behavior delay the course of ending this pandemic. The pandemic has revealed deep health inequities. Experts say the focus must be on boosting access to COVID-19 vaccines. It's not fair that, you know, as Canadians, we're getting ready for a booster shot um, when there are so many countries who've yet to administer the first shot, particularly to vulnerable communities like healthcare workers. <laughs> With more than a quarter of a billion infections and counting, the fight against the virus is far from over. Crystal Gamanson, Global News, London. Conservative Party pushed back ahead the clash over Aaron O'Toole's leadership. The leader of the Federal Conservative Party is pushing back on those in the party who question his leadership. Aaron O'Toole has now kicked Senator Denise Batters out of the Conservative National Caucus. In a statement, O'Toole says, I will not tolerate an individual discrediting and showing a clear lack of respect towards the efforts of the entire Conservative Caucus. Batters has launched a petition calling for an immediate review of O'Toole's leadership, but more than 25 Conservative MPs and the party president are defending him. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, is keeping an eye on this for us. David. Well, Donna, when the knives came out for Andrew Scheer after the 2019 election, few in caucus stood up for him. It is different this time. Plenty of people in Aaron O'Toole's caucus, about one quarter of all Conservative MPs, in fact, are publicly defending their leader. I'm happy to be part of uh, Aaron O'Toole's team. MP Melissa Lanceman says she is a hard no to what her caucus colleague, Senator Denise Batters, is trying to do. Came here and I was sent here uh, by the voters in Thornhill to stand up for Canadians. And all of this is, the infighting is a distraction. And I'm launching a petition so that are More than two dozen Conservatives took to social media to say the same thing. Deputy Leader Candace Bergen declared her full support for O'Toole. Harper-era cabinet minister Ed Fast tweeted at Senator Batters by name saying he can't fathom why she wants to focus on leadership games rather than on issues that matter to Canadians. And the party president, Rob Batherson, jumped in saying Batters' petition was out of order. That support for O'Toole from the party brass is also you, something Sheer never had. The... David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Canadian Blood Services wants to end the ban on donations from gay and bisexual men. The agency will ask Health Canada to focus donation screening on sexual behaviour to determine the risk of transmission of HIV and not on a donor's gender or sexuality. Right now, a man who has had sex with a man in the last three months cannot donate blood. A straight man, regardless of their number of partners in the same time frame, can donate. Once Canadian Blood Services submits its application to change the screening requirements, it will be up to Health Canada to approve it, and the process could take several months to a year. Cosmic carelessness next. Russia's reckless move that endangered astronauts. There's a big match in Edmonton tonight. Canada's men's soccer team is taking on top-ranked Mexico in a World Cup qualifier. Weather could be a factor. Temperatures are forecast to drop, which could be a bit of a shock for the Mexican team. Minus 10 is not easy on anybody, so <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a little bit tough. But, uh, I mean, you know, we're Canadian. We're built for, the, built for this weather. Beating Mexico tonight could move Canada one step closer to securing a spot in the 2022 World Cup. One country getting a yellow card by the international community over its recklessness in outer space is Russia. On Monday, it launched a missile to destroy one of its old satellites in orbit. And as Eric Sorensen reports, it's being called an irresponsible act that triggered a dangerous chain reaction. This month, Russia released military video of its new missile systems, capable of intercepting other missiles, aircraft and satellites. What few expected was this. 
that Russia would shoot down one of its own defunct satellites, dispersing an estimated 1,500 pieces of shrapnel into orbit, threatening some of the 3,400 active satellites above Earth. The largest is the International Space Station. The crew of four Americans, two Russians and a German were forced to take shelter in their docked space capsules for two hours in the event they had to leave suddenly. Washington is furious. Russia's dangerous and irresponsible behavior jeopardizes the long-term sustainability of our outer space and clearly demonstrates that Russia's claims of opposing the weaponization of space are disingenuous and hypocritical. Russia insists the fragments pose no risk and calls the U.S. criticism hypocritical. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says Russia is prepared to negotiate rules for space and says it's the Americans who are creating an arms race. Around 30,000 space objects, anything larger than an iPhone, phone are being tracked with countless smaller pieces speeding around Earth. The film Gravity dramatized a spacecraft being destroyed by debris from a Russian satellite explosion. In real life, the space station's Canadarm was pierced by debris this year. No serious damage, but proof that the risk is not science fiction. Space watchers are mystified by Russia's actions. This was an explosive event that created debris that affects not just the space station, but many other nation's satellites. And really, if, is, is this how Russia has to get people's attention? Satellites are essential for communications, weather forecasting, and financial and global security. NATO is concerned Russia wants geopolitical leverage in space. To demonstrate that Russia is now developing new weapon systems that can shoot down satellites. Washington says it will work with allies to develop a response Meantime, the U.S., Russia, and China are all building arsenals of anti-satellite weapons. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's here at Canada is the town of Brigus, Newfoundland, and Labrador. We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.